Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about why Big Law might not be for everyone. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together with the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta, I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about why Big Law might not be for everyone. Welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Well, to start off, let's clarify what we're even talking about when we say Big Law. What is this? Basically, it's just kind of the biggest, um, you know, top law firms, usually in, you know, the bigger, more major markets, um, which would be cities. Uh, and kind of the ones that make the most money and employ, you know, the largest number of people. Uh, you know, I think there's some firms that might be considered big law to some people and not to others. Generally, they're in lockstep with pay, so they all pay the same. But there are, you know, some big law firms that are sort of uh, on like a second tier for what they pay, but it's close. Uh, but generally it's just kind of like the top firms. Right. So the people, if you opened up like the AmLaw 100 or AmLaw 200, all the firms that are listed there, plus like possibly some smaller ones that are very, very boutique but I would say, you know, usually it's like the big offices in New York and Chicago and LA and Houston or wherever they are in Texas. I don't know. You would know that better, but... <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, if you look at statistics, you see that the vast majority of associates have actually left the firm they started at within five years. And I'm not really sure law students grasp this. Do you think so? I think this is the fundamental point that law students miss when they're getting into big law, especially law students that maybe don't have lawyers in their family or don't have experience Uh, with this business model, and especially because it's different than other companies. I don't think other companies or industries are necessarily based off, like they expect you to leave every single year, like kind of people fall off. Um, Big law is a pyramid. Um, Every big law firm is like that. And so there always has to be fewer people as you go along. Now, they don't want to lose a lot of people right at the beginning, Um, So losing people in their first or second year probably doesn't fit the business model, you know, but they're going to like every single year, they're going to lose some people, partially because people will want to leave partially because they'll be asked to leave, or pushed out. Um, Usually that's not public. Um, So it's hard to know, you know, whether the person was told to leave or chose to leave. Um, And so when you get to like year five and six, which would be considered um, a mid-level, you expect a lot of people from that class have gone at that point because that's when you're heading into, okay, these are the people who are probably going to be close to up for partner and kind of here for the long haul. Um, Although you're going to continue to lose people until you get to, you know, year nine and ten. Um, or now I think it might be 11 and 12. Oh my gosh, seriously, uh, they would send it, it that much. Out. Yeah, uh, when I started, it was more like nine years to partner. And so that's when you're kind of left with the last few people that are going to be up for partner and some of them aren't going to make it and leave then or, you know, get another title. But basically you can, you know, see how people just kind of like fall off in a pyramid as you go through those years. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because, I mean, I worked, you know, with summer classes, there were over 100 people. And when you look at who made partner from those classes, it was maybe a handful, like a couple of people, which is kind of crazy because these are all people who are, you know, top of their class, like very motivated. I mean, like, what's going on here? Why do people leave so fast? 
Well, one, um, they're going to get picked off by the firm. You know, like their work is not going to be up to the level that the firm expects. Um, or, you know, people might just not like you. <laughs> so for for those reasons, people will leave in terms of being asked to leave. Like things are not working out. You know, also like some practice groups maybe aren't doing as well. So they just have to find the like kind of lower performers like in their you, you know, maybe you don't have enough billable hours, but maybe there's not enough work. Like it could be out of your control. And then there's just going to be so many things about big law that aren't going to work for most people. Um, and they're going to realize over a period of time that this is not the lifestyle, the work, the work hours, the schedule, you know, people don't like billing their time. Um, there are a million reasons, but basically I feel like when you get to the smaller group at the end, those are the people where it works for them. And so when you're talking about a class of like 100 or 150, and then you're down to 10, you realize that big law does not work for most people. <laughs> that is a very good point. And I think something people really underappreciate. You know, I think there's so much emphasis in law school on getting that big law job, you know, getting the summer position, getting the offer, starting the job. And then it's kind of like, okay, great, you got it. Um, but that just doesn't mean, you know, that you're set up for life. Um, and I think it's worth thinking about this in advance, you know, whether it even makes sense for you to go into this environment um, or not. Because I think, you know, there are a lot of things people can do that don't involve like showing up to a job they hate every day, um, which the reality is, you know, a lot of people hate a lot of things about big law. It's just kind of the nature of the business. And I think as you pointed out, you know, the business model is for people to leave. And so there are incentives kind of directing you that direction. And then there are these things, you know, people really hate, I think. I was thinking about it for me. I mean, I, you know, I worked in various law firms, um, a summer associate and then permanent associate. And I think it falls into kind of three buckets of like the things that people really end up hating. Some people really hate the work and we're going to talk about each one of these. Some people just hate the work and, you know, it is what it is. Other people really hate the people that they're working with. And a lot of people hate kind of the work environment. Um, so let's talk a little bit about work. Like what do people do in big law firms and why do they not like it? Well, so I think this has changed over time. Um, but equally, people don't like it. Uh, so in the past, I think what people didn't like, especially starting out, was that they were doing all the kind of grunt work. So it's like a notorious thing that you would be a first or second year just doing doc review. And that was always what people didn't like. And that actually happens less now because most of the business models have moved that stuff to like outsourcing um sort of like almost like a call center model um so they're not paying for you know first and second year associates to necessarily do that work you are going to do some of that work but i don't think it's quite as bad in terms of that i think that generally though if anything now things are staffed leaner so there's going to be a lot on you quickly um and you're kind of going to be thrown into it um, and there's not necessarily a lot of time to figure it out. So I think it's a lot of pressure right from the beginning. Um, and so I think that can be hard. On the other hand, maybe there are things you wanted to get opportunities to do and you can't find it because it's very hierarchical and you're where you are on the food chain at a law firm. And so you're just being given things. And you don't necessarily get to say, oh, but I really want to X. You know, I you want to take a deposition. To. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go like to court. You're, you're a first year. You're not taking a deposition. Like there are other people above you who have been there for five or six years fighting to take that deposition. <laughs> and I think that's something that law students miss because sort of big law is known as like you'll get the experience, um, which you may. Yeah, and you I think might. like pro bono work <laughs> is a way to get more experience, but you have to fit that into your billable hours requirement. So it's a juggling act. So yeah, I think that you have very little control and there are people who just aren't hitting their benchmarks that they need to because it's not available or you didn't get in with the right people. You know, it's very political. Yeah. And I think, you know, more and more clients don't really want to pay for first and second year associates to do a lot of things. And so I think in some ways that's taken away opportunities that maybe existed previously. Um, 
Yeah, I think the doc review and stuff like that has dissipated a bit, but, uh, both because of outsourcing and also because of technology. But, you know, there's, I think for me at least, like a lot of it was just that people would just tell me to do things and like dump stuff on me and expect me to figure it out. And I didn't really have a lot of control over what I was doing. And like oftentimes, to be fair, like I was doing pretty interesting work. I actually didn't hate the work. I just didn't want to do as much of it as I was doing in the environment I was doing it in. But I think for some people, like they really do just hate this work. Um, and I think that's something to really think about. You know, what do you want to be doing in your work life? Like if you want to be, for example, doing a lot of client interaction, big law is probably not for you. Absolutely. The other thing about the work is you may be working for clients that you do not like, that you True. do not believe in their <laughs> values. Um, as like, you don't have a lot of control over that. Like, I don't know if, you know, there may be some things that you can draw a line at or you can kind of get around, but generally everyone does some work in areas that they are not comfortable with. And that's just what you signed up for. Right. I think that's actually a really important point, too, is to think about who is paying the bills here. You know, who has the money to pay the rates that big law charges? So when people come to me and they say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm really into environmental law. I'm going to go work at a big law firm. I just kind of look at them and I'm like, do you understand which side you're going to be on of these cases? Yeah. You know, like, um, like, you know, Earth First is not paying like a large law firm to do this, probably like maybe some pro bono, but probably not because it's going to conflict with their other client work. Um, you know, you really have to think about this stuff. And the same with like employment law, like you know, which side are you going to be on here? You're not probably, you know, unless you're like a very specific plaintiff side firm, you're not going to be defending like, you know, the person who's being sexually harassed. You're on the other side of that case. Exactly. And you really you don't get to make those kind of decisions, you know, as a junior associate, that that's not the work you want to do. Like a lot of the bread and butter of big law is sort of, you know, things that are not appetizing to a lot of people, like asbestos work. <laughs> um, <laughs> or like insurance, like blowing yeah. up. I, I interviewed with someone who was like, oh yeah, I spent all my time, I think it was like defending tire companies um, when their tires blow up and kill people. And I just kind of looked at him and was like, he's like, yeah, if you don't want to do that, you probably shouldn't come here. And I was like, OK. <laughs> and exactly. I think that you should know that going into it because I'm not putting a judgment call on like, you know, that work needs to get done. And right. that someone needs paying. to do it. Yeah. And, you know, it does fund other things, you know, like you will get to do hopefully, you know, some good as well. Um, <laughs> but you just you need to know going into it that that's going to be something that's put on you that you're not going to have control over. And so just make sure you're comfortable with that. Yeah. And I mean, I just think being realistic about this, you know, if you're if you're making a lot of money defending people, I think it for me it came down to it best. It was probably going to be sort of value neutral. You know, I did a lot of patent work and frankly, like it doesn't really matter which tech company wins these patent cases. Um, you know, we're, we're not destroying the world necessarily if somebody's fighting over like an Internet patent. It's just money. So, you know, that was at least value neutral. But it also meant every day eventually I woke up and was like, what am I doing with my life? This is completely pointless. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get to that point. So thinking about it ahead of time, like what will it be like? To work with these clients because you'll know what their big clients are you can look right. at that for any you know big law firm so just like think into the future you know how will you feel about it uh you know going forward right and some people really are motivated by different things like for me i wasn't particularly motivated by winning but other mm. people are like they just like to win um, and so if that's you, like this might be a great fit for you. Like you don't care who your client is. Like, you just want to win. You want to win every motion. You want to win every decision. You want to win everything that motivates you. I think those people often do pretty well at big law firms. I totally agree. And I think that there are people who kind of find the value in any work that they're doing. You know, well, I'm helping this person, you know, or I'm, you know, a part of keeping the economy going uh, and I'm developing valuable skills and, you know, some people want to put it to use at something else in the future. Um, and so definitely certain people, big law fits really well. I just think it's like most people end up not wanting to do it long term. 
Yeah, I mean, some people also are motivated by seeing their clients on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and being like, I was involved in that case. Like, again, I don't care about that. <laughs> it just like, isn't <laughs> fundamentally something I care about. And that's fine. But there are other people who are motivated by that and good for them. You know? And if you're at Big Law, you know, all of these places get their names in the paper and right. usually are involved in like big things that are going on. So exactly like wherever you end up, you probably will be involved in some of that if if that's where you're going. And I agree, like it's exciting to some people. Yeah, I just remember after I'd left, um, I'd written a motion for summary judgment kind of on the way out the door. And like a year later, they heard the case or whatever. And somebody called me who I used to work with. They're like, oh my gosh, we're so excited. Like, you know, your brief, you won, your, your brief won, yay. And I was literally, my reaction was like, great, you don't have to go to trial. Yeah. <laughs> like that was it. I, I did not have any other further emotional reaction. I think it was right when we'd started the law school toolbox and I'd actually gotten an email that morning from a student who was like, oh my gosh, I just want to let you know, like after working with you guys, I got an A on my exam and I'm so excited. And I was legitimately excited about that email. And that was the point in which I knew like, okay, I made the right choice. And I think that's the best feeling in all of this, you know, that you know, you're where you're supposed to be. And it's yeah. like, it might be one or the other, depending on who you are. But think about that. Like, what motivates you? What makes you feel good? Yeah. And I think that kind of ties into our next point about what people end up often hating about big law is, I mean, it sounds harsh to say, but really, it's the people. I agree. And I think that's the thing that um, kind of separates firms, too. True. Because um, I think, you know... In a way, big law is all the same. And in a way, you know, different places have a different culture and you kind of feel it going in and even interviewing, definitely working there. Um, but generally, the people who are at big law and do well and stay are going to be like really, you know, go getters, perfectionist, type A. Um, you know, there's only one way to do things and it's the correct way. And you have to basically, as a junior person, adapt to all the different senior people you're working with, you know, like to the point that like they require certain paper clips and they require things to be delivered in a certain <laughs> way. And I'm not exaggerating. You're not exaggerating. Pens. It just cracks And me like up. you get in so much trouble if you didn't know, like people will tell you ahead of time and you have to keep it all straight. And like some people want to be emailed. Some people only want to be called. Some people you can only go through their secretary and you have to remember all of that. And that's the stuff that really can separate you from someone who does well or not. And so you have to just go with it with those people. Like they're not going to adapt to you, you know, they're, and, and some people are not going to treat you with respect. Um, you know, I've seen lots of people like cry. I've seen temper tantrums in adult people. Um <laughs> In yeah, the I mean, hallways. Like, literally, like the stories of people yelling and throwing the stapler are actually true. <laughs> yeah. And I, I hope that maybe it's a little bit better now. <laughs> like, maybe. Hopefully. The times I don't have changed. But yeah, I think things are tolerated for some reason in this industry that are not tolerated in other industries. Right. And that goes into a lot of things. I mean, I remember once I was at like a conference for women lawyers and people were telling. You know, stories about like sexual harassment. And then finally someone stood up and said, okay, like there are a lot of recruiters in this room. There are a lot of partners. There are a lot of like high level people. Raise your hand if you think that a partner who did this would be fired at your firm. And almost no one did. And everyone was kind of like, all right, this is why we have a problem. Yeah. And so I hope that that has changed a little bit. I have no idea, um, you know, with kind of recent things happening right. in the last few years <laughs> um, at least I think some of it's been looked at maybe a little bit more or people would be more willing to like report people because I think that's part of the problem it's a culture of like stay quiet and don't tell anyone um, well but people who I mean I know people who reported and like yeah they got a settlement to leave mm -hmm. but they were still the ones who left and that's exactly like, still there the person who brings in the money is generally right. going to be the one who stays and kind of gets away with it yeah. Uh, so I think like, you know, on the other hand, there are great people. I think I've just found that most of the people <laughs> that, you know, I would want to stay in touch with don't stay because um, they don't want to, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not willing to change the culture. You know, they don't want to adapt to it. Yeah, I think a lot of this just goes back to the business model. Like, you know, the business model is someone has to bring in business 
And if that person is bringing in business, they are very valuable financially to the firm. And even if they're behaving poorly, no one really wants to get rid of them because people like to eat. Exactly. And that's that's definitely the culture of law firms. You know, and there are some where it's not as cutthroat. And I think some of it depends on the city you're in. I found a really big difference between East Coast and West Coast. In my experience, not for everywhere. (laughs) I know there are West Coast places um, (laughs) that you know of that are difficult and harsh. But I think there's no question that sort of like the New York mentality um, is just really intense in my experience. Oh, I agree completely. Um, And I think, you know, I mean, this may sound like we're being really harsh to firms, but I think you just have to understand, like, you know, the people who succeed in this work environment and end up being the people who are running the show, as we said, tend to have certain characteristics. You know, they tend to be highly competitive. They tend to be really driven. They tend to be a little rigid. You know, they tend to be workaholics. Like, you don't get to be a partner because you're, like, such a nice person who had a great work-life balance. That's just not how this happens. Totally agree. And there are people like that. I feel like they tend to have different roles at the firm. Um, Even if you look on who's on what committee, um, you'll see that like, you know, the committees that are all involved in, you know, business development and clients and making the money are usually the tougher people. And they're the people that have more power and have more shares and things like that. And then, you know, the people that are not are usually involved in sort of like a little more touchy feely areas. And so that's not where the money is. So they're right. just not going to have as much control over things. Right. And I think, you know, you have to look at like who is able to basically make someone a partner. Like you need somebody in the room who's willing to say, I need this person to be a partner to continue doing my work basically for you to become a partner. And like, you know, if you're not able to build relationships with people who are willing to do that for you or like, you know, basically have to have you around then you're probably not going to, you know, be able to stay because it's not like you just get to stay there for 20 years because you're doing good work. That's just not how this works, really. I mean, they are more and more they do have, you know, they have council positions and things like that. But, um, you know, if you want to be a partner and like stay indefinitely, that's going to be very challenging. And to me, the of council positions are the better positions. <laughs> that's I what I would choose. <laughs> like you are going to make less money, but you're still going to make really good money and I actually think you have more job security, less pressure. Um, it's much more like a job you go to versus like you have all the like stress of running the business on you. Right. So that's something to think about too, like what path, if if you think you want to stay in big law, like which path fits you better? Right. Because most, I mean, people also may not realize to become a partner at most firms, you have to pay. And so you know, that can end up in like tricky situations where you're borrowing money to basically like buy into this firm and then things happen and the work slows down. Like it can get kind of ugly. And also, you know, years ago, being a partner at a law firm meant you had job security forever and you were just going to stay at that one law firm. That was sort of the business model. And it's just not like that anymore. Like usually partners move around either by themselves or with a group Um, But I see very little people these days who are staying places forever. So it's not like you have that just like feeling of, okay, this is the rest of my career. Right. And there's just not a lot of personal loyalty, I'm afraid, unfortunately, at this point. Absolutely. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, we're not saying like, don't do this. We're saying be aware of like kind of what the reality of what you're actually getting into and in kind of a modern way. Because if you talk to someone who is, you know, retired partner they're gonna have a very different impression of what this was like because when they started out you know probably most people became partners if they stuck around and they had like a cushy life and they keep their job and their office forever and like it was okay but it's just a much more competitive environment now and i think they'd also tell you they made a lot less money than there was a a point in time where partners at law firms just like their salaries like shot up Right. Um, I think kind of like late 80s, 90s. Um, And so the pressure and the responsibility completely changed and the loyalty, like you said. I think just, you know, the amount of money that was going around was so much bigger. Uh, So I totally agree. It's just a different kind of environment. And we're giving you sort of worst case, um, which I think is also important to know. You know, like here are the most difficult things that you may encounter. I don't know that every law firm is like this, you know, and there may be places that are more 
self-reflective. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> very years. nice and kind and lovely to deal with. Okay, that might exist. Um, <laughs> let's move on, though, to the work <laughs> environment, because I do think this comes really straight out of the business model a lot. So what are the things people don't love about kind of the work environment and things like that? Well, I think it can be kind of tedious and boring and you're putting in a lot of hours. Um, and the other thing is you have to work more hours than you're actually billing in order to get to your billable number. You know, it's like if you need 10 hours a day, you're going to be working more than 10 hours a day. Um and so it's just going to be a lot of kind of being told what to do, especially at the beginning and just having to do it and maybe not enjoying what you're doing. And you need to be on call all the time. Um, and so that's what they expect of you. That's why you need to be reachable. Um, I remember a long, long time ago when like we first got Blackberries and everyone was really excited and I immediately <laughs> knew it was a bad thing <laughs> because, you know, once you got a Blackberry, it was like, okay, now you need to answer it whatever we call. <laughs> or, literally, you know. like literally yeah. anytime. I mean, yeah. No, that for me was probably the hardest part was just feeling like somebody else owned my time and also having to track my time, which drove me completely insane. Like I'm just very bad about keeping track of like what I'm doing at any given moment and to have to do that in six minute increments for like my entire life really just pushed me over the edge. Um, but, you know, I think about like even doctors, like doctors are on call and then they're not on call. Whereas your point, which I think is totally true, is as an associate, you're always on call. Someone could call you anytime and tell you to cancel whatever you have going on and like come to work. And that's just totally normal. And I don't know if this would be a popular opinion, but my opinion is that salaries have hit the point where that's actually fair. <laughs> they are paying you way too much <laughs> with no experience to start at these law firms. So like, I think that's where it happened was when um, specifically like first year salaries got so high, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and bonuses and things like that, that that's what you sign yourself away to like you have to earn that money right um and like you have to be realistic that like you're not actually providing that much to them right at the beginning and so what you can provide is like you doing whatever they say whenever they say it and so i think it's just important to think about where that comes from right and that might literally be like you're the person who has to figure out how to send a fax at three in the morning because nobody else wants to deal with it you know I remember I had a friend who was working on a deal that involved Europe, North America, and Asia. Oh, God. And he was the only junior person. And so he <laughs> actually had to be available around the clock. He slept in like two-hour increments. Um, and it just he couldn't do it he i think he did it for a year and that was sort of the end of that um but it sounded like insane like it would affect your health and no of one course. thought like this isn't fair right like maybe there's another way we can like cover some of these hours so this one person doesn't have to cover 24 hours every day because <laughs> i think things have become like much more leanly staffed than they used to yeah. be like they expect you as like the one junior person to like pick up all the slack for all of this stuff um, and you sort of have no recourse. You can't just be like, I don't want to. I'm right. Tired. No, I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's literally what you signed up for. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I like had some partner once like tell me not to go visit my grandmother on her deathbed because he needed me to like do something stupid for him. Um, in that case, I went anyway and told him he could fire me. But, you know, those things do happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that that's not that it's not that bad as the norm. Like I have worked with people who I think like understand where people um, but that's something you should get like a feel for when you're hearing about what the firm is like or stories like if I heard that story, I would think this isn't the place for me. Well, you know? in that case, like the night before in front of a bunch of other people, it was like, oh, yeah, of course, family first, like you need to mm -hmm. do this. And then something happened overnight and I woke up and there was a message. It was like, we need you to stay here. Like, what do you do? Because I think that some of these things, yeah, in their eyes, they are life or death. And right. like, and it was not I life always or say death. nothing is life or death unless it was you're working definitely on a death not. penalty case. <laughs> um, yeah, like nothing that a law firm is doing is really fits into that category. But I do think the stakes 
when you get wrapped up in it, they do become like the most important. You know, if you have a trial or a deal's yeah, happening. Like, yeah. Like we were at trial. Like I get it. It would have been more convenient with this thing that happened for me to be there. But it was also like, this is not really like you can't comparable. control. Yeah. <laughs> like it's the rest. And so that's something that I think people should keep in mind. Like if you're going to do this, don't get so wrapped up in it that you forget about your personal life and your life that's going to go on past the law firm because that's the other thing I see happen like you get wrapped up in it you start thinking that this is the most important thing and you know for some people maybe it is and maybe they don't have a lot going on outside of this but generally uh, I would just keep it in perspective like no matter what's happening what everyone else is saying like just remember for yourself what this is it's a job right and I think this is how people really destroy their relationships too and a friend of mine had a kind of semi joke in law school that he wanted to create like a law law firm misery index based on the number of partners that have been divorced every year. Mm. Um, And like, you know, he was going to basically make his choice on that. But, you know, I mean, you definitely see people like destroying the rest of their lives. Um, And that is a problem in the whole legal profession, I will say. (laughs) Like there are definitely people on like the government side, you know, public defenders and district attorneys that I think kind of run into the same thing. So definitely think about that too, you know, just kind of making sure you're, you know, if you need any help or things are getting out of control that you're like seeking that because I know that is like a problem with the profession. Very true. It is definitely a challenge across the board. Um, And I remember when I was uh, leaving my clerkship and I was talking to the judge about kind of next steps and he gave me the advice he apparently gives all of his departing clerks who are going into big law. He's like, don't take on a mortgage. And I was like, what? Mm. He's like, yeah, that's always my advice. He's like, you know, you get in this firm and you have all this money coming in and then you're like, oh, I should buy a house. He's like, as soon as you do that, you are stuck. He's like, do not get stuck. He's like, you need to be able to leave when you want to leave. He's like, there's something wrong with this. Like, you might like it. You know, you might be good at it. Go into it open-minded. Just make sure that when it comes time that you decide you don't want to be there anymore, you are not financially in a position where you can't leave. And I think that's great advice. I totally agree. Or it's like, if you're going to get a mortgage, don't base it on the salary you make there. Base it on like what an average salary would be at another lawyer job you want, which is going to be a lot less. Right. I would sort of live like that because for most people who go into big law, that's probably the most money they're ever going to make. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like not for everybody, but for most people, like the other jobs are going to pay lower. They're still going to mostly pay well, um, you know, and you can get by. But I would say just plan it out. Like if your plan is that you're only going to be there a few years and you're trying to pay off your student loans budget for that make sure you know and then you're going to have a job making half that amount like in-house or at a government job uh so i would kind of like live on that amount of money and know that you can because i think that this happens for everybody you make more money and you spend more money right and you sort of get used to it and then everything gets based on that and then if like it got way cut back you can't even imagine how you would pay all your bills so i totally agree don't get stuck where you need to make that amount because the amount they make in big law is not really realistic to the amount that most lawyers are making in all sorts of other jobs, but they, you know, choose to leave because they want a different lifestyle or that's what I've seen most of the time. Yeah. I think if, you know, if you're going to go into big law, I think you just need to go in with your eyes open, kind of realistic about what you're getting into, realize you're probably like everybody else. You probably will leave like three to five years down the road and that's totally fine. You take away the skills, you take away the money you've made, hopefully some of it at least. But I do think, you know, you want to be realistic that, okay, this is probably not the job I'm going to have forever and plan your life around that, you know, pay off the student loans, like get a, get yourself in a position where you actually can go and do something else if you want to do something else. Because like the opposite thing, like if you end up staying, let's say, and you make partner and you hadn't planned for that, like that's fine. Great. You can always <laughs> adjust the other way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, do, I think not being tied into it is sort of the key. And there are people I know who ended up being partner who told me they were not going to be partner. <laughs> we're not trying for it. We're not interested. Um, and like, you know, there's the occasional people where it goes that direction. That's just extremely rare. Yeah. So remember that like the majority of people are going to leave either on their own or be asked to leave, not want to continue. 
Um, so I think it's always good to plan that way. And then if you end up becoming partner and, you know, making a lot of money, you can always change how you're doing things. But right. saving and being responsible about it is like never a bad idea. Yeah. And I found that like the people that I look at that became partners for my class or whatever, various places, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. You know, it's not, it's almost mm -hmm. like not the people that were like the total go getters. You're like, oh, this person's totally going to be partner. You know, they go off and do something else. And then this person, it's kind of like, you know, the closet gunner in law school. You're like, oh, that person is the one who's a partner. Okay, that's interesting. So I think it's just very hard to predict. Um, a lot of them fly under the radar, I've noticed. Yeah, you know, there exactly. are some people that were always going for it and they make it, they usually don't make it as quick as they expected to. <laughs> right. Um, I've noticed, but I, I've rarely been able to predict who is going to make partner. And so, you know, keep that in mind. And you can go for it and it not work out uh, and, you know, just kind of have a backup plan. So I'm not saying there aren't people where this makes sense for them and they won't be happy and it won't work out. I just think that the numbers tell us that that's not the case for most people. Yeah, I just think you can't go in assuming like you're going to be that, you know, 5% or whatever that ends up being partner 12 years later, it turns out now. <laughs> yeah, at least. All right, well, we're kind of over time on this one. Um, any final thoughts you want to share? Yeah, my final thought is that I think that some people end up in big law, maybe for the same reason that some people end up in law school without thinking about it, which is just that it's like the next thing or it seems like the best thing to do or kind of the ultimate um, you know, the same reason they pick like the firm that's ranked the highest or the school that's ranked the highest without thinking about what's going to make them happy. So my advice would just be to always ask yourself, why am I doing this? What are my goals? How do I think this is going to work for me? Um, and make sure you can answer that question, you know, with a real answer that makes sense. Um, you don't need to do something just because everyone's talking about it or that's what you hear about in law school. Um, it definitely doesn't mean it's the only option. There are so many different things you can do, you know, as a lawyer with a law degree. Um, and so that's really what I would say is just make sure you know why you're doing it. I think that's great advice and also always have a backup plan. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. With that, we are out of time. For more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with us, you can check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.